All right, so we are now going back to our series of study from the book of Acts. Uh, last week we took a pause, a break, because it was Memorial Day. And uh, today we're going to continue on Acts chapter 2. We did Acts chapter 1 already uh, a couple weeks ago. So let's go to Acts chapter 2. If you remember, the last message we have was while they were waiting, right? Because they were told at the ascension to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promised Holy Spirit. And so the title of our message today is from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, and why is that day significant? Well, that's the day when the promised Holy Spirit came. So our whole text, actually, it's all the way to verse 41. But let me go ahead and just read verses 1 to 14, I believe, is, or 13 is when we, we will stop in our reading. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. When the day of Pentecost had come, that's where I got the title, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to, to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya, around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. We will stop our reading there and we will look at the things that we can gather from this passage. Remember, the Bible was given to us by God so that we will know more about him and so that we will know what he wants from us and what he's teaching us and so that our lives may be changed in, uh, for the purpose of giving him glory in our lives. So these passages were written, an account of how the Holy Spirit arrived on that day, that, uh, the day of Pentecost, as promised by God. So that's the first thing that we would like to see here that the promised Holy Spirit did come. Remember, there was a promise from Jesus, not just on the day of the ascension, not just on the day of the ascension, but if you read, like I said, the, the book of John, starting in verse 13, 14, 15, 16, and all the way to 17, there was a promise that the Holy Spirit will come. And so it was not just a, uh, a, a guess that maybe it will come. It was a for sure promise from Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit would come. And the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost 
as promised by Jesus himself. If you are noticing, I do not want to refer to the Holy Spirit as an it, that it came. No, he came. Because the Bible is very clear in telling us that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. A person, a person who came on the day of Pentecost. And when the Holy Spirit came, the scripture that we just read told us that the whole house was filled. And the disciples were filled by the Holy Spirit. It came in the appearance of like fire, tongues of fire. And then it distributed itself, okay? The fire, which is the Holy Spirit. The visible manifestation to them was like tongues of fire. Rested on each one of them in that house as it filled the whole house, the whole house. And each one of them was empowered by the Holy Spirit. So at this point, what we know is that every one of them in that house, if you remember in Acts chapter 1, the number given to us was about 120 of them. And each one of them probably, of the 120, was filled by the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, some people are saying, wouldn't it be nice if that would still come, happen right now? You know, tongues of fire coming and resting on our head. But actually, the good news for us is this. The Bible already said, as we will read early, uh, later on, that for every person who is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who rested upon them and who filled them. It's the same Holy Spirit that's given to us when we surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ. So we have to understand, I can claim that I do have the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. I said, why, do you feel it? It's not about feeling it. It's about knowing and believing what the scripture says. So when the Bible tells me that when I was baptized, my sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit was given to me, I must believe in that. So if you have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, if you have been baptized, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who is also God. The Holy Spirit is not just the manifestation of the power of God. No, he is a person indwelling every Christian who is following Jesus Christ. And so in this case, we see that the tongues of fire that rested on them, who is the Holy Spirit, empowered the disciples. You know, the Holy Spirit that has been given to us is also given to us to empower us to live the life that God wants us to live. Apart from the help of the Holy Spirit, we would not be able to live the life that God wants us to live. And that's actually what makes a Christian different from a non-Christian. The very presence of the Holy Spirit that indwells him. That's one of the things that makes us different from those who are not in Christ. The presence of the Holy Spirit. And of course, in addition to that, is that we are forgiven. And those who are not in Christ are not forgiven of their sins. But the very presence of the Holy Spirit in us makes us different. That's why the Bible calls us saints. Right? Saints. Even though we know that we still fail, we still sin, the Bible refers to us as saints. Why? And it's not because we are 
all ethically perfect. No. It's because we are different. And what makes us different? The very presence of the Holy Spirit in us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Our sins have been forgiven. We are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is what makes us different. And plus, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live the life that God wants us to live. And so what did they do? They were empowered to preach the gospel, to be witnesses. Remember in Acts chapter 1, at the ascension, Jesus told them, You're, you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then he said, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. And here's the first proof of what the Holy Spirit did for them. They became witnesses. They started preaching the word of God. The scripture is telling us that what they did was as they, as they uh, were filled and rested on each one of them, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed. And then it says, it's because they were speaking, in verse 11, they were speaking of the mighty deeds of God. They were empowered to preach the gospel, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. You know, we have to believe the truth that as empowered believers of Jesus Christ, you are empowered by God, by the Holy Spirit, to speak the mighty deeds of God. If you remember last, uh, last week uh, during our prayer time, Melissa was asking for prayers for Eli and Darla. And we were, pray we were praying for them because... Albie and, and, and Lawson in baseball have been talking to Eli and Darla about the mighty deeds of God that God has done for them. Lawson especially was talking to Eli about it, how he got baptized and saved. That's speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Witnessing to someone else. And each one of us have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the same thing. Speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And you don't even have to speak in tongues to do that. Actually, these uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, I believe they just started speaking and a different language came out. <laughs> and so the people around them started hearing them in their own language. They were not even trying. They might be just speaking Hebrew, but it's coming out in a different tongue so that the people around them may understand. And they spoke according to the scripture as the Spirit was giving them utterance. They spoke as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Remember, as followers of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we too can speak about the mighty deeds of God to the people around us. The people were amazed. The people were amazed. In verse 13, it says, in verse 14, it says, they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? Later on, 
in the later verse, in chapter, uh, same chapter, verse 36, it says that they were pierced to the heart. Verse 37. The people who heard, the people who were amazed, when they heard the gospel about Jesus Christ, after Peter stood up and explained to them what is happening, or what does this speaking of tongues mean? After Peter explained to them about it, then in verse 37 it says, those who believed were pierced to the heart. Mike was speaking of repentance. And you see, that is the result of us hearing the gospel and believing in the message of it. And so the people who believed were pierced to the heart. Why? Because they realized that they have offended God. They crucified the very Messiah sent by God. But Peter said to them, but God made him both Lord and Christ and raised him from the dead to conquer the problem of death for everyone. That's what Peter said, told them. And so because they heard the gospel that Jesus paid the penalty for their sins, that he's the one who was crucified for their sins, when they realized that they were pierced to the heart, it's like, you know, knowing that someone gave his life for you, like, for example, just last week, you know, we were talking about the many lives lost so that we can have this wonderful country that we live in, that we should never forget it, that there were people who actually made a sacrifice for this. It should touch our hearts saying, wow, this did not come easy. As children growing up, knowing the sacrifices of our parents make us say, you know, I will appreciate what my parents have done. And I will be very careful in how I live my life or take care of the things that they have left for me or given to me. This is the same thing that happened to these people when they realized who Jesus Christ was. The very Messiah they have been waiting for. And then they ended up crucifying on the cross. Their hearts were pierced. And you know what? Every time we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to people, those who hear and believe our message will be pierced to the heart. Those who hear and believe. Why do I have to say the word believe? Why? Because there are those who will not believe. That's why in verse 13 it says, while others were in amazement, in verse 13 it says, others were mocking. And that's the truth. We preach the gospel. There will be those who will believe. And their hearts will be pierced. But there are those who will mock. There are those who will mock. And you know what? Sometimes we're afraid of those who will mock. And so sometimes we end up just not speaking the mighty deeds of God. And that is sad. That is sad. When we are hindered to speak of the mighty deeds of God because of the people who mock. Forgetting the truth that everyone needs to hear. And there are those who will believe and their hearts will be pierced. But we don't know who those are. We don't know who those are. Actually, there are those who will mock at first, but later on believe. That, that's the truth. There are those who will mock you first. But if you stay with it, and in all sincerity, 
and love and faith in God, you continue to proclaim the message, then eventually they might believe. And when they do believe and pierce to the heart, then they will ask the same question that these men who heard and believed did. In verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, what Peter talked about, about what's happening on that day, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? See, when we speak about the mighty deeds of God, that God is holy, and yet he is loving, and so he went to the cross to save us from our sins. The question that people would ask would be, wow, what do I do now? What do I do now? Now that I have heard of the truth about Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and his ascension. Now that I know that, what do I do next? So Peter gave instruction on how to respond to the gospel, something that we all need. You hear the good news, you ask the question, what now? Right? What now? Peter gave them. Of course, this is a classic answer to that question. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and baptism. Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus, during his time on earth, made a prediction and a proclamation that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed. So the very first time the apostles had a chance to do it, that's exactly what they did. What the apostles did is a pattern for us. When we preach the gospel and someone heard and understood and asked the question, what must I do? We can just do exactly what Peter did. Tell that person, repent of your sins. Why do you have to repent of your sins? Because that's the very thing that Jesus died for. He died because of our sins. Our sins need to be atoned for. Mike explained it to us earlier. Why the cross? Because there was a sin, and sin is something that cannot just be overlooked. Someone has to pay the penalty for our sins. Thank God that he gave Jesus Christ to do that for us. But he does want us to repent of our sins, to have sorrow for it that leads to godly repentance. And then Peter said to them, your sins are forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture tells us in the last verse, verse 41 of our study today. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. 3,000 of them were baptized that day and were added to the church. So as followers of Jesus Christ now, we are to preach repentance of sin and baptize those who will believe. The same thing 
that the early Christians, the apostles, and the followers of Jesus Christ did. Because the gospel is about Jesus dying for our sins. And if we truly believe in what Christ has done, it should lead us to repentance. To repentance. Being sorrowful for what brought Christ to the cross. Praise God! We have Jesus Christ who shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us pray. Our God and most gracious Heavenly Father, oh dear God, you are such a good and loving God. When we deserved to be punished, you loved us with an everlasting love. You sent your only Son, Jesus Christ. He is the one whose blood was shed, whose body was tortured to death and nailed to the cross because of our sins and for our sins. Lord Jesus, thank you for paying the penalty of our sins. You are the only hope for mankind. Lord, as your people, empowered by your blood and by the presence of the Holy Spirit, oh, Lord God, use us as instruments to proclaim your mighty deeds to the world so that they too may have a chance to hear the gospel, believe in the gospel, and Lord, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Oh, dear God, use us. Use us for the glory of your name and for the furtherance of your kingdom. And now, Father, we ask you to dismiss us from this place today. And Lord, throughout this week, may you find us being witnesses of you to the world. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen and amen.